Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois. We had rain last night, <clears throat> just enough to boost the humidity past the point where you can cut the air with your a knife and to where you can spoon it, okay? Um, we've had a, a heat advisory here for over a week and uh, things are only uh, looking better in the future, I hope. <laughs> So, uh, um, otherwise, what's happening here in Southern Illinois? COVID is crushing us. Um, ICU beds are at a premium. Hospitals, the big hospitals, are going on diversion. We're having to hold patients with heart attacks and strokes for up to three days. But the good news is that this isn't a crisis. We don't have to start masking on the streets. And um, yeah, if you're in Southern Illinois, please, please, please take all the precautions that you can because um, every hospital is getting crushed. So <clears throat> with that as our intro, let's go to a story. This happened just a couple years ago. Um, Vivian and I were going to visit our daughter and grandson, who was almost one. And we had just arrived in New Zealand. Uh, Ethan had not seen us for, well, he had seen us on Skype, but in terms of his memory horizon, that's who we were. We were the Skype, the Skype people. And uh, we'd been a little anxious about how he was going to react to us in the flesh. And initially he was kind of shy. But when bedtime came and it was a bath night, Nana Vivian um, volunteered to go and uh, help him take his bath. And that was okay with him. So Nana went in to help him um, with his bath and they had some bath toys and they were playing with the water and splashing and having a good time and Ethan looked up at Nana and said, happy, just like that, not a question, happy. And Vivian looked down at him and said, Ethan, are you feeling happy? And he said, yes. And then he looked up and looked into her fa face and said, Nana, happy? Oh, those are the moments that just melt a grandparent's heart. Uh, and um, those of you who aren't grandparents yet, you have something to look forward to. Yes, James, I know you're up in Michigan. Okay, and, um, oh, you say it's terrible up there, too? Well, you don't have anything, you don't have any idea what it's like in southern Illinois, you lucky dog. So, head out to the beach for me, okay? <clears throat> so, happiness. Um, this is a big thing in America, you know? We've even written it into our Constitution. Every man has the inalienable right for the pursuit of happiness. But did you know that the definition of happiness at the time that the U.S. Constitution was written is different from what our definition is today? If you get a, get an, a dictionary out and you look up the de definition of happiness, it says something like a positive emotion, joy, contentment. That's not what happiness meant 200 odd years ago. If you find a dictionary from 200 odd years ago, uh, you will discover that happiness then meant prosperity, thriving, well-being. Wow. So when the framers of the Constitution said every man has the right to the pursuit of happiness, 
they weren't talking about our feelings. They were talking about pursuing prosperity and well-being. A lot of us gave up trying to achieve prosperity a long time ago. We're just trying to survive. And we've settled for feeling happy as a substitute for thriving. How else can you explain the epidemic of addiction the popularity of entertainment in the United States. Paradoxically, the positive psychology revolution that has swept through academia in the United States in the last uh, 20 years declares that, well, they don't declare, they've done studies comparing people who were striving for happiness, feelings, versus people who were just taking life as it came. And they found out that striving for happiness actually makes you less likely to experience happiness. Bizarre, isn't it? And so they dug deeper and the best they can formulate at this point in time is that happiness, feeling happy, about 8% of that is genetically determined. You know, the, half cup, the cup half full versus the cup half empty. Only, only about 10% of that is determined genetically. About 40% of it is dependent on our choice, our perspective that we choose to adopt in life. And that leaves 50% of what determines whether we feel happy or not on our circumstances, on our environment. Which is why there's such a big emphasis on social determinants of health um, in health care and in education, uh, our environment has a tremendous impact on whether we feel joy content or contentment. Which takes us full circle back to the definition of happiness that the framers of the Constitution were familiar with, that prosperity thriving, well-being, is the root of reliable, the reliable root of feeling happy. This week's Bible guide, in case you had guessed it, was entitled, The Secret of Happiness. Now, what does the Bible have to say about happiness? Well, I'm going to pick up the Bible, and we're going to, I'm going to read Joshua 1.8. The book of Joshua picks up after Moses had died. And God is speaking to Joshua, who is the leader who had to step into Moses' shoes. And as a part of his instructions, his um, pep talk to Joshua, he gives, he gives this guidance. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you need to meditate on it day and night to observe and do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success the definition of happiness 
when the King James Version was translated, is the same that the same as the definition uh, that was familiar to the framers of the Constitution a hundred years later. Happiness meant prosperity and well-being. And the touchstone in the Bible is that if we want to prosper and experience well-being, which leads to feeling happy, we need to study God's Word. And that's what this, this study guide was all about, Bible study. And that's the next practical application, the doing that we find in the lives of people in the Bible that built their spiritual strength. Okay. For those of you who are not sure that the Old Testament applies to you, I just want to point out that the New Covenant that's spoken up of in the New Testament, so in Hebrews, uh, you can look it up later, chapter 8 and verse 10, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah uh, this passage, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That is the essence of the new covenant, that God would write his laws into our hearts. And when the writer of Hebrews was writing that, he wasn't thinking about principles or some vague notion of what God's laws were. He had a very distinct notion, picture in his mind, of what God's laws were. Generally, today as Christians, uh, that references back to the Ten Commandments, which are expanded on throughout the whole Old Testament. But the Ten Commandments are the core of the law. But the law is much more than a set of rules. It's a relationship of trust so profound that we're willing to do what God asks us to do. You know, here in the United States right now, we are in a major crisis of trust and have been for quite a while. But in this COVID pandemic, that crisis of trust has, has revealed just how unstable we are as a society. We don't trust the government. We don't trust each other. We're left to fend for ourselves. And you know what? I don't think anybody's happy about where we are in our society right now. That's not the relationship that God wants with us, friends. He invites us into a relationship based on who He is and who He is committed to being in our lives. And He invites us to trust Him. And when you trust someone that deeply, that with that degree of certainty, wouldn't you be willing to do what He said? That's the essence of what Bible study is based on. So how does this play out in my life? Okay, it's simple. I open my Bible and I read it on a regular basis. Not as an obligation or as a duty or as a ritual. Bible study for me is seeking to engage God directly. Now, one of the songwriters in the Old Testament put it this way in Psalms 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, Christians sing that song and they have no idea that he's talking about the Old Testament. Okay? Thy word is a light unto my path. And Paul in the New Testament said, All Scripture... For, which for him was the Old Testament. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You cannot follow Jesus without reading the Bible for yourself. 
you know, Christians like to brag that the Bible is the most popular book in the world. More copies of the Bible have been sold than any other book in the world. We don't mention the converse fact that there are more Bibles sitting collecting dust in the world than any other book. Because the simple fact is, while we may hold a Bible as a token of, a symbol of, I'm a Christian, most of us don't read them. If prayer is the breath of the soul, then Bible study is the food. No breath, no life. No food, no strength. It's that simple. If prayer and Bible study are not a part of our lives as Christians, then we are going to be weak, emaciated, dead Christians. And that's what people see when they look at our lives. So where to begin? If I was going to pick up the Bible right now, okay, the the study guide this week spent uh, a lot of times looking at the old te at the Ten Commandments. So let's use that as an illustration. So the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20, and it starts this way. Okay, now I'm reusing the Bible that. I got in high school that has been with me, that has all of my notes in it, uh, all of my underlining, okay? This is the Bible that speaks to my heart. And I would encourage you to get a Bible. Yes, there are all kinds of translations. Just get a Bible and own it. Make it your own, okay? And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's the introduction to the Ten Commandments. This is God reminding us who he is. He is the God who delivers. And for the people listening at the foot of the mountain, as God is speaking these words from the mountaintop, Okay, this was a literal, real experience. I mean, they had been slaves less than a month ago. Plagues had been falling all around. They had been f freed out of Egypt. They had walked out on their own into the wilderness. Uh, they had been trapped next to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies had come to recapture them and take them back to slavery, but God had protected them and opened up a way through the sea. Okay? When God said, I am the Lord your God who have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, that was a tangible, real experience, a memory that was fresh in their minds. Now, if I have experienced deliverance, in my life. And it can be any kind, okay? Uh, deliverance from addiction, deliverance from depression, uh, deliverance from habits that are destructive, what Christians call sin. Okay? If I have experienced deliverance, then these words just double down on the joy the contentment, the, the sense of freedom that I experience in my life. That's who's speaking to me, the God who delivered me. But what if I haven't experienced that deliverance? What if I feel like I'm still a captive, like I can't escape? And it may be circumstances, it may be habits, addictions, I don't know what chains are binding you. But if you haven't experienced deliverance, this passage is still for you. Because it is an assertion that there is a God who can deliver, who will deliver, who wants to deliver. 
Now, what I've been doing as I've been talking here is sharing what goes on my, in my mind as I'm reading devotionally. I connect what I'm reading to my experience, to my spiritual life, what has happened in my life. And if I can't relate to it, if it hasn't happened in my life, then I recognize this as a promise of what can happen. That's the essence of devotional reading. So, when I pick up the Bible and I start reading, I start reading devotionally. Okay. But you know, devotional reading, while it's good for connecting at a heart level with God, it's kind of unreliable because it's all dependent on my past experiences and the associations that I make. So the second thing that I do when I read the Bible is I start seeking knowledge. I want to know what the Bible says about certain topics okay, that are meaningful to my life. Now, <clears throat> if you go to a big city not Fairfield. You won't find this in Fairfield. But if you go to St. Louis or Washington, D.C., you will find all these advertisements for guided tours. Okay? And they can be focused on, you know, architecture or history or historical homes or museums, parks. You name it. Whatever your interest is, you can find a guided tour in large cities. That's what a Bible study guide is. It's a guided tour of the Bible. And it's, it's really a wonderful tool because it helps you to efficiently find your way through unfamiliar territory. So after, but after taking a guided tour, the weakness is you only go where the guide takes you, okay? And you only see what the guide wants you to see. You don't get to see all the nooks and crannies of the city. So, <clears throat> me being me, um, after taking a guided tour, and I usually take a virtual guided tour or, you know, um, the 10 most popular, th the 10 things you've got to see in Washington, D.C., but then I strike out exploring on my own, which basically means I start driving the streets and looking for things. And that's what I do with the Bible, too. I take a guided tour on its subject, and then I start exploring, reading for my own. And that entails taking notes, because on a guided, when I'm exploring, I want to find my way back to things that I discover. So I have a Bible, a journal, Actually, it's a virtual journal today, okay? But as I'm reading, I take notes in my journal of the thoughts that I had and the connections that I found between different parts of the Bible. Because the Bible's a big book. I mean, it doesn't look like a big book, but it's compact, it's dense, there's there's lots of lots of different stories and commentaries and connecting them is an important part of Bible study. And finally, after I've read devotionally, after I've sought knowledge, I study how to communicate what I've learned and what I'm sharing with you is the result of that study. So, let's go on with the, the Ten Commandments and let's see what we discover in terms of knowledge in the Ten Commandments. So, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, <clears throat> Our devotional reading <laughs> reminded us of who is speaking. Okay? I have heard this passage 
intoned as if this is a jealous lover. You know, that redneck lover who don't look, don't speak, don't touch, don't even think about anybody else but me. It's me, 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 me. Now, that's not the God that's speaking here. This is not a selfish God, a self-oriented God. This is a God who loves and cares for you, for me, and who has put himself on the line for us. And all he is asking is that we don't betray that relationship. You know, when Vivian and I got married, I made a commitment that she was the only one that I wasn't going to look at another woman, I wasn't going to touch another woman, I wasn't going to dabble with other women because I had given my heart, my soul, my body to her. And that's the kind of, that's what God has done with us and that's the relationship he asks for. That's the essence of commandment number one. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers and upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. There is a lot in that second commandment, okay? <clears throat> but I want to start out with a question, okay? Do you worship a statue? Do you know anybody who worships a statue? Then does this even apply? Why to us? Is this passage obsolete for us enlightened Western Christians? You know, dehumanization, turning people into things, is at the heart of prostitution, pornography, racism, and a whole host of other evils in this world, evils that even secular people say, Thou shalt not. What I hear God saying here is don't turn me into a thing. You see, we relate to people. We use things. And it's really easy to use people and gods. Use them to get things that we want, to get things done. And Christians are as vulnerable to this as anybody else. This commandment has never been about idols. It's been about the relationship that we have with God. And as you read the, read the rest of the Bible, major portions of the Bible focus on these two commandments, having other gods before God and idolatry. Ways that we can betray our relationship with God, ways that we can dehumanize, de-godize, <laughs> dehumanize him and turn him into a tool. Okay? There are also stories of people that were faithful, and people that had a re vibrant relationship with God. But these commandments are, are the core to a large part of the Bible. Now, we could go on, okay? But Bible study is not something that you do in just a sound bite. Okay? So I'm going to stop there, but I challenge you this week, pick up your Bible. I don't care where you start. Pick it up 
and start reading it. Because that's today's touchstone, friends. That's the secret of happiness. Thriving, well-being, prosperity, and feeling. Reading the Bible is core to developing a strong spiritual life within the context of Christianity. Are you a Christian? Did you open your Bible this week? Now, I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just asking you to look in the mirror. Did you open your Bible this week to read it for yourself, devotionally, seeking knowledge, learning how to share it? If you didn't, then maybe, just maybe, that could be why you're not experiencing the happiness that you want. Uh, or why you're not experiencing the victory and the strength and the, the power, spiritual power in your life that you long for. Now, if you're not a religious person, well, I'm going to invite you to pick up the Bible and read it for yourself. I'd like you to experience something new. And if you need a friend to tag along, share the adventure, just message me. Okay, if you're watching this on Facebook, then you've got my, you've got my address. If you're watching this on YouTube uh, or on our church website, then just use the messaging. It'll come straight to me. I'd be glad to share the adventure with you. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.